From Prehistory to Modern History, Changing Sex and Practical Effects, Time to Make Their Mark. Welcome to Jurassic Park. No, I am the father. And here we go. That belongs in a museum. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? You're going to need a bigger boat. This is Sparta! Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Dr. Grant, my dear Dr. Sutton, welcome to Jurassic Park. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Easily Entertained. My name is Bryson Olson, and today we are talking about what I consider to be the first big blockbuster, Jurassic Park. While technically Jaws is more more often considered the first big blockbuster movie, I personally think Jurassic Park is a bigger milestone in the world of movies, um, and I'll get more into it why later, um, but let's talk about the movie first. Chapter 1. The Source Jurassic Park is based off the novel of the same name by Michael Crichton. Recently, I actually got to read the whole novel after having owned the book for a couple years, um, but my ADHD never really let me focus and get past the beginning, so I finally got to get through the whole thing. So with the start of school and kind of a need to get out of my apartment, I decided to take my hammock, go on my school campus, and just read. I became so infatuated by this novel that my favorite movie series was all about. Sometimes I couldn't put it down. I'd take it with me to my work so that I can read it when I wasn't busy. It took me about a month, but I had finally finished the whole thing. The novel and the film are actually not incredibly dissimilar, at least in terms of the plot. The premise is still pretty much the same. A few scientists, Ian Malcolm, Alan Grant, and Ellie Sattler, are invited by John Hammond, who's like an eccentric businessman to come check out his incredible new wildlife preserve. They get there, and to their amazement, there are dinosaurs living and breathing. They learn how the scientists did it, and question if it was reasonable or not. And during a tour of the park, a storm comes in, and in that, the power gets shut off by Dennis Nedry, who works at the park and is a bit of a sabotage Sabatua. The power loss causes the electric fences to shut off, and then, of course, the dinosaurs get loose. We follow our main characters as they try to make it back to the visitor center while narrowly avoiding death by dinosaur, all the while realizing that they tampered with forces that ought not to be tampered with. Eventually, most of the characters do make it back and are able to head on home with some well-needed peace and relaxation from the terror they just endured. So the plot and the basic story of the novel and film are are essentially the same with just a few differences. The movie, as often happens when put in books to movies, uh, it leaves out some of the characters and takes a couple of the scenes away. Like in the novel, Henry Wu, who is the lead scientist at the park, is actually killed during that first book. And he's killed by raptors trying to keep them distracted while I believe Alan Grant is trying to get the power turned back on. Dennis Nedry's death by the Dilophosaurus, if you remember from the original film, in the book is slightly more brutal. Um, when it blinds him, he is still pretty much aware and it describes how it rips him open and eats him while he is still alive. Or Hammond, in his own arrogance, he's going to get something from his bungalow on the island near the end of the book. However, he falls down a hill and encounters a group of compies that just end up killing him, uh, which is not how the movies play out. The movies clearly did leave out some of these scenes. However, they were not particularly integral to the main point of the story, um, which is... As Ian Malcolm put it, Life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but life uh, finds a way. And that is the whole point of Jurassic Park. The purpose of the story is all about how humanity tries to control things that aren't really meant to be controlled in nature. And the more boundaries we try to put on it, the bigger and badder it will be when it comes back to bite us in the butt. Chapter 2 The Creation 
The film adaptation of Jurassic Park was brought to life by director Steven Spielberg, who you have probably heard of his movies, but just to name a few, there's Jaws, Back to the Future, Indiana Jones, and the recent remake of A West Side Story. And if you were paying attention, Jaws is the movie that is often regarded as the first big blockbuster. And Jaws does have quite a bit going for it. I will give it that for sure has incredible animatronics, has wonderful cinematography that is still being used and learned from today. However, the reason I think Jurassic Park is a bigger first blockbuster is because of how it was created. To bring the magnificent prehistoric giants back to life for the movie, Spielberg used a combination of both practical effects and something that was pretty new at the time, computer-generated imagery, or what we all know as CGI. Originally, the plan was to actually use stop motion for some of the movement shots of the dinosaur. However, they weren't entirely sure if it would look that realistic, given like old movies like The Valley of Guanji or The Lost World with stop motion dinosaurs. It didn't seem to have that that realistic feel to it. So they instead decided to go with CGI mixed with practical effects like animatronics to blend the creatures into the world with more realism. And the CGI in this film is actually not really that used. In this two hour movie, there is only about six minutes total of CGI footage. But this was one of the first big uses of CGI in movie making. It had been used before in things like Terminator and Westworld, um, but it was the first physically textured CGI. It was meant to look real. It wasn't a robot or something that looks fake. It was meant to give that realistic feel to it. And to this day, those effects still hold up pretty well, and CGI now is used all the time in movies, and it has become pretty commonplace for movies that even are just real, normal events, like that you wouldn't need CGI for. Um, But this is why I think Jurassic Park is so influential, though. It showed that you could bring something to life that nobody had ever seen before. We had had artist renditions of dinosaurs before, but even bringing them to life with, like, stop motion, there was a limit to what you could really do, and CGI could change that. Because now we have movies like Infinity War and Avatar that use CGI to a huge extent, but everything still feels pretty real. And Jurassic Park still holds up well with that modern standard. And I think this is what kind of started the modern trend of using CGI with the real world. Chapter 3. The Spectacle Jurassic Park was released on June 11th, 1993. Technically the 10th because of late night showings, and I wish we would just start saying they're releasing that day, but I get it, it's because it's only at night. So it was officially the 11th. On its first night, it earned $3.1 million and hit a record-smashing $50 million its first weekend, which obviously, by today's standards, seems a bit weak with movies earning like half a billion in their first week. It's freaking insane. But for the time, that was unheard of. It was an incredible opening, and people didn't know what to expect. But the movie was well-received. It's now being regarded as an absolute classic and having a total box office for just that one movie of just over a billion. During the pandemic, movie theaters to try and regain some traction after having been closed for so long would show classic movies, and I almost always saw Jurassic Park on that list. I even went and saw it again when it was back in theaters over the pandemic. Because what better movie for the big screen than a movie with a big spectacle? My first time seeing the movie was for the 20th anniversary back in 2013. They had brought it back to theaters and I got to go see it with my dad. We got to see it in 3D. It was incredible. And since then, like many others had with that movie, I was captivated by it all. It fueled my love of dinosaurs, which I still hold to this day, which in turn also kind of inspired me as an artist, because now I love 
to draw and I would constantly draw dinosaurs because it was what I was interested in. I still draw them all the time and I even have a water bottle right next to me that is just plastered with dinosaur stickers that I had drawn. Jurassic Park will be turning 30 years old next summer. It has six movies in the whole franchise, a Netflix show, and a short film. It is Universal Studios' most profitable franchise. The one coming close would be, of course, the Fast and the Furious franchise, which just kind of has more movies. But it inspires the love of dinosaurs for both children and adults across the globe. It captures our imaginations like no other. It will remain a classic for years and probably come to theaters over and over again, which I see absolutely no problem with. It stayed relatively true to the novel, which is more than a lot of movies can say. And I ain't really going to mention the sequels, because although I love all of them, it is kind of up for debate uh, with public opinion whether they are that good or not. I think they're all incredible. However, I have some friends that are like, meh, I don't really care for them. The original film uses groundbreaking effects, both practical and digital, that still hold up to this day, which is pretty surprising. It holds a phenomenal score, and it will never be forgotten, and whenever you watch it, you are most certainly easily entertained. Thank you for listening to Easily Entertained with me, Bryson Olson. If you enjoyed, be sure to tune back in on the first and third Tuesdays of every month at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time to hear all about entertainment. Easily Entertained is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. 